My name's Beat Innes, and I'm a teaching fellow here at the University of Reading Meteorology Department. And the, um, the video we're making today is about um, weather systems and how they develop, why they develop, and what kind of weather they actually bring us. And the kind of weather systems we're going to be talking about are the typical kind of weather systems that bring our weather in the UK and Western Europe, particularly during the autumn, winter and spring uh, months, and the kind of weather systems that bring most of the rainfall uh, to the UK and Western Europe uh, during that time. And you can see here a satellite image and a weather map of the kind of thing that we're talking about. The typical swirl of cloud you see over the UK in the satellite picture shows a typical fairly well-developed depression crossing the UK with a trailing band of cloud heading down towards the Bay of Biscay and over Spain. And on the weather map, um, you see um, the typical kind of circular pattern of isobars with low pressure in the center and a set of frontal systems with warm and cold fronts, the kind of things that we're very used to seeing on weather maps when we watch the weather forecast on the television. And what we're gonna be talking about is how those kind of systems develop and what are the, the necessary ingredients that you need to, um, to cause these things to, to develop. And also what role they play in the, the overall circulation of the global atmosphere. It's always interesting to have a look, little look at the history of um, how um, particular weather systems have been discovered. And um, so we'll, we'll spend a few minutes thinking about the history of the, the scientific research that's gone on into this kind of weather system. And I guess man, and particularly um, people in Western Europe and the UK, have known about this kind of weather system for many, many years. Farmers and sailors particularly know about how the kind of weather systems typically form, what kind of weather we get in terms of winds and, and heavy rain. But the first real scientific research uh, that was done on um, this kind of mid-latitude weather system was done by a group of scientists working out of Bergen in Norway during the early part of the 20th century. And now, Bergen is one of those places in the world that experiences a lot of this kind of weather system. And it's, I guess it's no accident that the, the group of scientists who discovered them and, and did the scientific research into them were, were working somewhere that gets hit by a, this kind of weather system perhaps once every three days or so, and sometimes even more regularly during the winter. And there was a group of scientists there working uh, under a scientist called um, uh, Jakob Björknes, who um, documented these, these weather systems and um, made very, very many observations of them. And by making lots and lots of observations, they were able to say something about the typical structure of these weather systems. And I've got a picture here from one of their early research papers, a paper published in 1922 about this kind of weather system. And it shows the cloud patterns and wind circulations that you would expect to see uh, with a typical uh, depression system. And the thing you've got to remember about these pictures is that they were produced before the era of satellite images. Uh, these scientists working up in Norway in the 1920s had no satellite pictures, no idea of what weather systems looked like from above. But by taking lots of observations from the ground, they were able to come up with a, a structure, a typical structure of these kind of weather systems that looks pretty much like the, the way we understand weather systems today. So the first question you might want to answer about um, these kind of weather systems is why, why do they happen in the first place? We know that they bring us um, lots of our rain, we know that almost all our strong winds occur in association with these weather systems. So why do they happen in the first place? And the answer to that um, lies in looking at the temperature distribution across the whole globe, and particularly the temperature difference between the tropical regions of the globe and the polar regions of the globe. And we know that the tropical regions of the globe are warm in general, and the polar regions of the globe are cold in general. And that's because the tropical regions um, receive more radiation from the sun than the polar regions do. That temperature difference between the equatorial parts of the globe and the polar parts of the globe is one of the driving reasons for why we have these mid-latitude depressions. And the reason that the whole global atmosphere is actually moving at all, and the reason we get any winds, is because the atmosphere is trying to even out the temperature imbalance between the pole and the equator. If there were no atmospheric motions whatsoever, then the, the, po the polar regions of the globe would just get colder and colder, and the tropical regions of the globe would just get warmer and warmer. And what the atmosphere is actually doing in response to the temperature gradient is trying to even that temperature gradient out. So the winds in the atmosphere are effectively trying to take warm air from the tropics and move it up towards the poles. 
And if we have a look at the, the map of typical temperature at the surface of the Earth in the Atlantic sector during the winter, we can see here that the, um, uh, the tropical regions are fairly uniformly warm, and as we get up towards the poles, it's fairly uniformly cold. But in the centre, around about sort of um, between 30 and 60 degrees north, we can see the cha temperature changes quite rapidly over quite a short distance. And it's that very sharp temperature gradient in mid-latitudes that actually leads to the development of the kind of weather systems that we're talking about today. So if we go back to the history books again, the, the group of scientists working up in Norway um, looked at this temperature gradient, and they realised that it was a key part of the formation of um, the particular weather systems that they were interested in. And they referred to this very sharp temperature gradient, the boundary between the warm air in the tropics and the cold air in the poles, they referred to that as the polar front, um, a boundary set, separating warm and cold air. Uh, there's some speculation that they were the reason they called it a front was associated with um, the fact that the First World War was happening at the time, and there was a boundary between the, the forces of the Allies and the, the, the Axis on the other side, and that was the Western Front, and maybe this, this analogy um, carried forward into the, the weather situation here with a boundary between warm air and cold air um, being the, the polar front. And they believed that all the depressions that they experienced in Norway, all the weather systems that came across them, formed on this temperature gradient, on this polar front. And to some extent, they, they were right about that. Most of the weather systems that we see crossing the Atlantic, hitting the UK and Western Europe, do indeed form a, a, on this, this um, temperature gradient between the warm and cold air. And key to that fact is the fact that this temperature gradient is what scientists refer to as being unstable. And if a, if a physical system is unstable, basically means that if you make a small perturbation to that um, physical system, that perturbation will grow rapidly with time to become a large perturbation. And I've got a little analogy here, a very simple analogy, with the idea of a ball um, sitting in a particular position and what would happen to that ball if we gave it a very small push. And in the first case here, we've got an unstable situation where the ball's sitting on top of a hill. If we gave the ball a small push in either direction, it would roll down the hill and end up quite a long way away from where it originally was sitting. The other example here is a, a stable situation where the ball is sitting in the bottom of a valley. And we could give the ball quite a large push here and it would move up the side of the valley and we let go and it will roll backwards and forwards but eventually it will settle down to its original position. And so that's a stable um, situation whereby we can give the, the, the physical system a small push and it will come back into its original configuration. It won't move away from its, its original uh, configuration. And the pole to, temp pole to equator temperature gradient is unstable in the sense that if a very small perturbation d develops on that temperature gradient, then it will grow with time very rapidly to become quite a large perturbation within one or two days.